section zero of the end of the middle age twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by pamela nagami the end of the middle age twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by eleanor constance lodge introduction the history of europe from twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three is of noteworthy interest and importance but it is also so extraordinarily complex that it is impossible to tell the story in orderly or chronological sequence europe had lost by this time such unity as was given to it in the earlier middle ages by the prominence of the papacy and the empire and it had not yet gained such an approach to unity as it acquired by the formation of distinct national states whose relations with each other whether of friendship or of hostility render it possible to construct a history of international wars and diplomacy from the sixteenth century onwards the essential thing to grasp is that the period was one of transition a time in which medieval characteristics were decaying and modern characteristics were growing up but in which the former had not disappeared and the latter were not yet strong enough to take their place popes and emperors still claimed to be the joint heads of western christendom and sometimes acted as if their supremacy was still recognized but their claims were practically obsolete some emperors such as rudolf and charles the fourth recognized the change and tried to devise a new policy to suit the altered times others such as henry the seventh and sigismund talked and acted as if the old traditions were still unshaken so again we find a pope like boniface the eighth defying national independence in the tones of an innocent the third or an honorius the fourth whereas a more prudent pontiff martin v evaded the control of the council of constance by making separate terms with the various states of europe and devoted himself not so much to the task of ruling the church as to that of restoring the temporal power in the papal states it is the same with the growth of nations which ultimately shattered the medieval conception of a united christendom england was the only state which was really organized in the early part of the period and even england passed in the fifteenth century through a prolonged civil war the wars of the roses which for a time seemed almost fatal to national unity france underwent horrible convulsions during this period but the dawn of better things began with the inspiring career of joan of arc and with the administrative reforms of the reign of charles the seventh spain was still non-existent by fourteen fifty three but the prolonged war against the moors had given to the various kingdoms of the peninsula such a community of interests and general character as facilitated their later union the growth of german unity was obstructed by the endless diversity of its political organisms and by the fatal union of its crown with the shadowy dignity of the roman empire but the tendency of the age toward unity and consolidation is to be traced even at this early date in some of the separate states of germany notably in brandenburg italy the teacher of europe in art in literature and in political philosophy was the most hopelessly divided by its geography and by the strong individuality of many of its component parts and italy remained a mere geographical expression until the nineteenth century like all periods of transition the age is one of numerous and bold experiments many of these experiments were successful and many failed but the history of the failures is often as important and instructive as that of the successes the great slav race which for generations had been conquered or driven back eastward by the germans made a great and for a time successful effort to recover its independence and extend its power we may trace this movement in the hussite wars in bohemia and the union of poland and lithuania under the strong house of Jogello. 
the teutonic knights strove to utilize the last crusading impulse of the middle ages to found a great state on the baltic they failed because their organization was ill-suited for civil government the age of crusades was over and the united slavs were too powerful but the state of prussia after all survived the ruin and dissolution of its creators a notable experiment was the attempt of the famous hanseatic league to maintain the interests of merchants and the predominance of german influence in the baltic and north sea they also failed because a federation of towns could not hold its own when national states were formed and because the baltic lost much of its importance when trade was diverted to the atlantic but their advancements were great in themselves and their bold assertion of the power of merchants marks a great change from the military and feudal ideals of the middle ages another interesting experiment provoked in some measure by the strength of the hansa towns was the attempt to combine the scandinavian states by the union of kalmar these and other efforts of the age give it the appearance of almost kaleidoscopic variety but all have their lesson the most striking experiments however were those in art in literature and in science the fifteenth century is pre-eminently the period which is known as the renaissance or the new birth one side of this intellectual activity is the revival of the study of ancient learning the hunt for manuscripts the study of the classical languages the exposition of the great writers of antiquity and the copying of their style perhaps the best representatives of this accumulative and imitative side of the renaissance are pope nicholas v the founder of the vatican library and aeneas silvius piccolomini afterwards also pope as pius the second but the renaissance was not only imitative it was also creative it emancipated men's minds from the old restraints imposed upon them side by side with the revival of classical learning went on the growth of national languages and literatures of italian in dante petrarch and boccaccio of english in chaucer and wycliffe of french in a series of writers between joinville and comines there was also a marvellous display of originality especially in italy in painting and sculpture it would take too long to describe the change in words and it is far better to see it for oneself a visit to the italian rooms of the national gallery and a study of well-selected photographs of italian pictures will enable any one to trace the gradual abandonment of the stiff and lifeless forms of early art the close study and delight in nature and the exercise of unfettered imagination which mark the progress of painting in the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries the object of this introduction is to show that the period is well worthy of study the more it is followed out the more fascinating it becomes and it must never be forgotten that it is the period which begins the renaissance and leads up to the great achievements which follow the reformation in the church the discovery of a new world the spread of education and the diffusion of literature the general change throughout europe from medieval to modern life Richard Lodge. End of section zero. Section one of the end of the Middle Age, twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three, by Eleanor Constance Lodge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter one Germany and the Empire. 1273 to 1378 part 1 before 1273 the decline of imperial supremacy had already begun the great emperors of the hohenstaufen family frederick barbarossa henry the 6th and frederick the 2nd had done something in the past to revive the already weakening power of the empire and to maintain the theory of universal rule but the fall of their dynasty was followed by disastrous disputes between the rival emperors an epoch known as the great interregnum which did much to destroy the authority of monarch both in germany and in europe and the period now opening was marked by still further decline in the ideal of imperial supremacy and in domestic power 
in theory the empire was still the roman empire the emperor was direct successor of the caesars semper augustus with temporal rule over the whole world from the days of frederick barbarossa the title holy had added a character of sanctity to the institution had upheld the claim of the emperor to divine right to rule over christian society and had placed the holy roman empire side by side with the holy catholic church pope and emperor together were to exercise spiritual and temporal rule over the world and to form the one bond of unity in a europe composed of masses of feudal states this medieval ideal of universal authority had always been shadowy and unreal but not without effect although england france and spain the most independent countries of europe had never really acknowledged the territorial supremacy of the emperor and their kings had refused to do homage for their lands they had never failed to recognize imperial precedents and even in the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries despite the discredit caused by the great interregnum the emperor was still looked up to as an international power and imperialist doctrines were still held by writers and students of the science of government thus in theory the emperor claimed the right to be recognized as the superior of all european kings and rulers but in reality though his opinion might have had weight in the case of any question of international interest only certain small states admitted his authority within their own borders and the term empire came to have a definite territorial significance at the close of the thirteenth century france lay outside the imperial limits on the west although her boundaries were more restricted than in modern days and provence burgundy and lorraine were all strictly parts of the empire on the east poland and hungary were still independent and on the south part only of italy was considered as actually imperial land outside these boundaries the emperor might perhaps command respect for his dignity but could certainly not enforce obedience to his authority there was also another aspect of the imperial position ever since the tenth century the german monarchy had been attached to the roman empire or in other words the same man had always held the two dignities of german king and roman emperor and this with disastrous results the interests of the empire and of the kingdom of germany were hardly ever the same and yet each was certain to suffer from anything which hurt the other for example when the emperor fought expensive wars in italy they in no way benefited the german kingdom but germany suffered very much from imperial quarrels with the papacy which brought her also into discord with rome again the fact that the german nobles were imperial vassals princes that is who held their estates straight from the emperor gave them an exalted sense of their own dignity and made them less ready to submit to the rules which he laid down in his character of king above all because the empire was elective the german monarchy became elective also and this system of choosing the ruler weakened the power of the crown so much that it was almost destroyed each emperor was supposed to go through four coronations this as a matter of fact he rarely did but the three most important crowns were generally assumed the german crown of aachen aix la chapelle only conferred strictly speaking the title of king of the romans the preliminary step for every emperor the crown of burgundy was of slight account and during our period charles the fourth was the only emperor who went to arles to obtain it the third crown of italy or lombardy was received at milan or monza and chief of all the real imperial crown itself could only be conferred at rome and was held to bring with it that right of universal rule so splendid in theory so feeble as we have seen in practice quite strictly the emperor-elect was only king of the romans until this important ceremony had been completed but he could exercise full powers from the time of his coronation at aachen and it has generally been found convenient to give him his full title from the first with the death of the last representative of the great family of hohenstaufen which for more than a century had occupied the imperial throne there was great hesitation on the part of the electors to fill up the vacant office 
the right of choice had now become practically centred in the hands of seven great princes the archbishops of mayence or mainz treves or trier and cologne or Köln, to represent the german church and four lay electors these latter ought to have represented the four great nations of which germany was composed franks schwabians saxons and bavarians but the duchies of franconia and schwabia no longer existed and the right was exercised by the count palatine of the rhine and the margrave of brandenburg in company with the dukes of saxony and bavaria in 1256 the votes of this electoral college had been divided between richard of cornwall brother of henry the third of england and alfonso the wise of castile the former was crowned at aachen and paid an occasional visit to germany but never really took up his office the castilian king did no more than issue an occasional proclamation the result was that with no restraining hand to check their encroachments and private feuds the nobles became more unmanageable than ever and feudalism ran rampant when richard of cornwall died in twelve seventy two the country was in such a state of anarchy and turmoil that all parties felt the need of a real ruler and pope gregory the tenth who was anxious above all things to raise a new crusade for which a german monarch would be the best leader refused to recognize the claims of the unenergetic alfonso and urged a fresh election therefore in twelve seventy three the question of a new emperor and a new king of germany was seriously considered and the choice of the electors fell on rudolph count of Habsburg, a prince who they hoped was neither strong enough nor rich enough to rouse much fear or jealousy by his elevation the new emperor was a man of considerable force and independence or as carlyle puts it justness of insight toughness of character and general strength of bridle hand rudolph was not one of the chief princes of germany but an important count nevertheless and from his hawk's castle in switzerland habichsburg or habsburg had spread his power widely throughout the old duchy of schwabia in person he was far above the average height thin and upright with small hands and feet and a face whose eagle eye and hooked nose betokened strength and energy while his thin determined lips were also capable of showing a keen sense of humour moderate in meat and drink and zealous in warlike enterprises he was the darling of his soldiers and commanded general respect and admiration his piety is shown by the story of how he lent his horse to a poor priest who was carrying the host to a sick man and was afraid to cross a rapid torrent and then refused to take back an animal which had carried so sacred a burden something of his promptness and resource is seen in the account of his coronation at aachen when the new sovereign was prepared to receive the homage of his princely vassals there was no sceptre forthcoming and without it he could not bestow the fiefs delay might have been dangerous for the nobles were none too friendly but rudolph averted any postponement of the ceremony by seizing the crucifix from the altar and declaring that the sacred sign of salvation for the world could well be his sceptre it was over a very complicated dominion that rudolph was called to rule germany was split up amongst many great princes both spiritual and temporal archbishops bishops and abbots held what were called sceptre fiefs since they were granted to them originally by presentation of a sceptre lay lords such as dukes margraves palgraves and graves had banner fiefs all claimed to have no superior but the emperor all asserted the right to exercise practically independent power in their own estates to judge their own causes levy their own taxes and make their own wars as they wished the breaking up of the old duchies of franconia and schwabia had largely increased the number of tenants-in-chief landowners that is holding straight from the emperor himself and quite insignificant nobles small towns and even villages often claimed the head of the empire as their immediate overlord this multiplication of estates was aided by the very usual practice of dividing the property of a dead man amongst all his sons instead of giving the whole to the eldest certain families were particularly important at this time the Ascanian family ruled in the mark of brandenburg and the duchy of saxony the house of Wittelsbach, 
was also split into two branches the elder possessed upper bavaria and the palatinate the younger ruled in lower bavaria the welfs held the duchy of brunswick the wetens later possessors of saxony were now the lords of meissen and thuringia besides the habsburgs themselves there were two other families which were to become very prominent later on the house of luxembourg in the territory of the same name and the hohenzollerns the head of which frederick burgrave of nuremberg was a cousin of rudolph and had been largely influential in securing his election the three archbishops with electoral powers were the most important spiritual princes though there were many others for most great churchmen were territorial lords by far the most powerful and dangerous temporal ruler of the time was odokar of bohemia who in addition to his slav kingdom had taken advantage of the interregnum to lay hands on austria styria carinthia and carniola which gave him a very firm footing in southeast germany besides princes and bishops the imperial cities were now rising to importance some of the larger towns of germany those of the south which had prospered because of their proximity to the great trade routes and those of the north which carried on commercial enterprises by means of the baltic and the north sea were independent of all but the emperor were recognized as estates of the realm capable of representation in the imperial diet and were called imperial cities these diets were in theory feudal councils of the whole empire summoned from all parts of the realm for common business and composed of all the great princes and representatives of the imperial towns but they met at present very irregularly and had little control over the different states amongst which they were intended to bring some sort of unity rudolph showed his practical wisdom and clear-sightedness by realizing that it was impossible to maintain the old ambitions of the hohenstaufen that he would only waste his strength in vain endeavor should he strive to regain their italian possessions and that his true policy was to strengthen their position in germany to reduce the excessive power of his imperial vassals and to build up a strong territorial position for his own family to effect this it was necessary to win allies to secure the friendship of the pope to crush out rivals to his power that he intended to emphasize the national character of his policy is shown by his persistent use of german and state documents and in the prosecution of business when a messenger from the king of bohemia began to explain his embassy in latin he was interrupted by the emperor with the words lord bishop when you have only concern with priests use your latin but amongst us speak german rudolph's first act was to gain friends by the marriages of his numerous family on the day of his coronation one daughter was wedded to louis of the palatine another to albert of saxony next he turned his attention to the pope rudolph never went to rome to receive the imperial crown but he had a magnificent meeting with gregory x at lausanne where he formally confirmed the cessions of italian territory already made to the pope gave up any claims in the angevin kingdom of naples and sicily and together with many of his barons took the cross in token that he would on the first opportunity fulfil the pope's most fervent wish by undertaking a crusade to the holy land the old policy of the hohenstaufen was finally abandoned when the habsburg monarch made a treaty of friendship with charles of anjou their bitterest enemy and promised to marry his daughter clementia to charles's grandson italian schemes certainly never tempted the prudent emperor italy is like the lion's cave he was wont to say one sees traces of the steps of those who go thither but never of those who return after these measures rudolph was ready to turn his attention nearer home he felt his position in germany would never be secure so long as he was threatened by the enmity of odokar of bohemia odokar had never recognized the election of twelve seventy seven his own vote had been rejected although as king of bohemia he had claimed the rights of an elector by virtue of his office of imperial cupbearer he had also repeatedly refused to appear at the diet to justify his possession of the german dukedoms of austria carinthia and carniola 
and had of course never done homage despite the rather doubtful support of some of the princes the emperor found a good many german nobles ready to fight against the slav king and his army was sufficiently strong to cause the capitulation of vienna and force ottokar to come to terms the latter consented to do homage for bohemia and moravia to renounce his claims to austria styria carinthia and carniola and a double marriage was arranged between a son and daughter of each monarch there is a story that this homage was to take place privately in a tent and that during the ceremony the tent collapsed revealing the proud ottokar magnificently dressed on his knees before the pauper count of Habsburg in his plain leather jerkin such an incident however is not only totally improbable but quite unnecessary as an explanation of the speedy failure of the present agreement neither side adhered fully to the terms the marriage plans were never accomplished and the discontent of many imperial nobles who found rudolph less compliant than they had hoped gave ottokar an opportunity the death of pope gregory robbed the emperor of another ally and in twelve seventy eight the bohemian king renewed war with every hope of success the two armies met on a great plain north of vienna known as the marchfeld and an engagement of great violence took place both kings fought in the thick of the battle rudolph at one moment was attacked by two knights at once had his horse killed under him rolled off into a stream and was only rescued just in time from this awkward situation ottokar fought gallantly long after success was hopeless but was killed treacherously in the end by two austrian soldiers who attacked him after his surrender in revenge for his execution of one of their relations for brigandage and his adversary who had commanded that his life should be spared arrived too late to save him the bohemian defeat was complete the kingdom was handed over to the guardianship of odo margrave of brandenburg during the minority of the dead ottokar's young son wenzel the second of bohemia wenzel was married to rudolph's daughter guta and his sister agnes to a son of the emperor austria and the two other disputed provinces were bestowed upon rudolph's two eldest sons albert and rudolph with the exception of carinthia which was given to meinhardt of tyrol whose daughter was married to albert this settlement was one of the greatest importance from this date austria has remained the hereditary possession of the house of Habsburg and its chief source of strength the foundation was laid on which the later fortunes of that great family were to be erected rudolf had done much to strengthen his family and something to consolidate the central power but not so much as he wished in vain he endeavoured to win over the princes by marriage alliances and the people by suppression of private war the nobles remained obstinate the towns objected to his imperial taxation and the organization of justice and government was still defective above all he was unable to effect the greatest wish of his life the establishment of an hereditary monarchy the electors feared the growing strength of the Habsburgs and refused to choose his son albert as successor when the emperor ended his toilsome career in twelve ninety two adolf of nassau a poor and insignificant count was crowned at aachen adolf's rule was short his unexpected activity and determined attempt to strengthen his position speedily raised up enemies against him and gave a party to the disappointed albert of austria germany was divided into two camps and the war which broke out was ended by the battle of gulheim the death of adolf struck down something by albert himself gave the victory to the latter the electors could no longer refuse him their votes and he was proclaimed emperor as albert I. the new sovereign was not prepossessing in appearance boniface the eighth when consulted as to the election had objected to his uncouth and rustic mien he was blind of one eye rude and harsh of face strong but ungainly in figure and his indomitable energy was tempered by no gentleness and few scruples his character has doubtless suffered by the legends concerning his rule in schwabia where he has been handed down to tradition as the great persecutor of the mountaineers in the district later to become switzerland 
but though there may be no grounds for the accusations of heartless cruelty and oppression he was a stern fierce man not easy to check when the interests of his family were at stake End of section one section two of the end of the middle age twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by eleanor constance lodge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter one germany and the empire twelve seventy three to thirteen seventy eight part two albert's policy was a continuation of that of his father he left italy entirely out of account made peace with philip of france and turned his whole attention to germany here his plan was to support the towns against the nobles and keep a firm hand over the most powerful of the princes his chief danger lay on the side of bohemia whose sovereign wenzel the second had been elected king of poland in thirteen hundred and in the following year was also offered the crown of hungary albert was furious but was saved from violent opposition by the unexpected death of king wenzel and his only son the last male descendants of odocar thus ended the bohemian family of the primasilides the crown of bohemia was elective and by mixture of threats and bribery albert secured the choice of his own son rudolf and hoped thereby to have secured for the habsburgs another territory of the greatest value king rudolf however failed to abate the hostility felt by the bohemians for the habsburg line and on his sudden death in thirteen o seven the electors despite their promises refused his brother frederick the fair and chose instead henry of carinthia a brother-in-law of king wenzel the indignant albert made preparations for an expedition against the bohemians but this was suddenly hindered by his own assassination thirteen o eight the murder was the work of one of his own nephews cheated as he believed out of his rightful possessions by the close-fisted albert and encouraged to the deed by many discontented nobles who hated their ambitious ruler albert's sudden death again made a break in the line of the habsburg emperors a disputed election followed the french king whose influence had been much increased by the late emperor's friendship put forward his own brother charles of valois as a rival to albert's heir frederick of austria in the end however the electors were faithful to the almost universal custom of choosing a german and voted for henry of luxembourg brother of the archbishop of treves who naturally gave him his support henry the seventh was about forty years of age a man well skilled in arms of middle height with fair hair and a fresh-coloured face he was also well educated and could speak french german and latin with the new monarch quite a new turn was given to imperial policy henry looked back to the glories of the hohenstaufen he determined to revive their claims of universal dominion and above all their headship of the ghibelline party in italy thus his reign belongs rather to the history of italy than to that of germany and can be kept principally for the next chapter one great acquisition however he did make in germany not for himself but for his son bohemia was not too happy under their king henry of carinthia he was idle and inefficient and did nothing to quell the disorders of the country which was in open rebellion against him certain of the bohemians turned in their need to the new emperor and proposed to bestow the kingdom on his young son john on condition that he should marry elizabeth a daughter of wenzel the second and the last survivor of the premislides family this arrangement was accomplished and john of luxembourg became king of bohemia this done henry set off without waste of time to secure for himself the iron crown of lombardy and the golden crown of rome henry's italian expedition left neglected germany a prey to rival factions and sad confusion prevailed when his death at siena in thirteen thirteen rendered a new choice inevitable the election which followed the death of henry the seventh was one of peculiar difficulty the rights of the seven electors were more or less established 
but no provision had been made for the splitting of families and territories into two parts two branches of the wittelsbach stock ruled in bavaria there were two margraves of brandenburg and henry of carinthia still laid claim to the bohemian throne occupied in reality by john of luxembourg there were rival candidates also representing the three leading houses of the time john of bohemia the late emperor's son was eventually rejected as too young but that still left in the field albert's son frederick the handsome of austria and louis duke of upper bavaria a warrior of great repute delay of more than a year was caused by these complications and when the election was at last made the votes were divided between louis and frederick five being given to the former and two to the latter neither candidate intended to give way and both raced to aachen to secure coronation at the traditional spot here again the honours were divided frederick won the race but the town would not admit him and he had to be content with a ceremony at bun performed however by the archbishop of cologne to whom especially belonged the rite of consecration louis on the other hand was admitted and crowned in aachen by the archbishop of mayence civil war followed and was waged for eight years with varying fortunes the austrians frederick and his brother leopold were also hampered by struggles in their schwabian lands where the mountaineers were fighting for independence against Habsburg rule at last the decisive blow was struck at muldorf twenty eighth september thirteen twenty two louis the bavarian had the support of the young john of bohemia who was thought by some to deserve the chief credit of the victory the towns also were principally on his side and foot soldiers played a prominent part in the fight a sign of the gradual change which was coming in the art of war frederick the handsome commanded in person on the opposite side and fought with distinguished valour though overpowered in the end and taken captive the decisive turn was given to the struggle by the arrival of a fresh troop which the austrians welcomed as an expected reinforcement under the young duke leopold but which proved to be an addition to the enemy's forces louis remained master of the field and frederick was sent as a prisoner to the castle of trausitz not far from nuremburg here he is said to have amused himself by carving sticks and up to the present day supposed specimens of his work were still being sold to tourists in the neighbourhood an old warrior called schweppermann made himself a name by brave service on the victorious side and the emperor's words when food was served frugally after the battle have passed into a proverb jedermann ein ei dem frommen schweppermann zwei an egg for every man but two for the honest schweppermann shortly after this victory another stroke of good fortune helped to extend the witzelbach power in thirteen twenty two brandenburg fell vacant by the death of the last representative of the ascanian family and was transferred by the emperor to his own son louis this acquisition it is true cost the friendship of john of bohemia who had hopes of his own in that direction but danger from his estrangement was not yet obvious if louis hoped for peace and tranquillity now that his claims were secured in germany he was very much mistaken his new enemy was even more serious than the austrian duke being none other than the pope himself the papacy at this time was closely allied with france some thought little more than her tool in thirteen o five the archbishop of bordeaux had been chosen pope chiefly by the influence of philip the fourth and from this time the papal court had been established at avignon a place which though not actually french territory was perilously near the lands of france philip must undoubtedly have proposed this change of residence as a means of securing his own control over the head of the church in thirteen twenty three john the twenty second the pope at the time declared that to him belonged the right of sanctioning an election that louis therefore had taken his title of king illegally and that all his decrees so far were null and void going further still he pronounced sentence of excommunication on the unsubmissive bavarian and expecting to find ready support from bohemia and austrian rivals of the emperor 
proposed a new candidate in the shape of charles the fourth of france but he did not reckon on the growing national feeling in germany a wave of indignation swept through the country and lewis turned the tables on his adversary by declaring the pope himself deposed on the charge of interference in imperial italy and for holding heretical doctrines this quarrel was of rather a different character from any previous dispute it was complicated by the pope's relations to france and the consequent international questions which arose and it was distinguished by the national feeling displayed in germany where lewis was supported warmly by the church the towns and the franciscan order encouraged by the attitude of his country lewis entered on an italian expedition which opened very favourably despite the absence and opposition of the pope the emperor was crowned at rome two excommunicated bishops anointed him and the crown was placed on his head by lay officials of the city a ceremony which struck even those who took part in it as strange and doubtful as a practical demonstration of his full imperial power lewis set up a pope of his own with the name of nicholas v and together they paraded the streets of the capital in triumph the triumph was very short-lived lewis's partisans were of no real stability they dropped away from him towns which had received him gladly closed their gates upon him on his return journey the terrified antipope fled to john the twenty second humbly craved for pardon and was imprisoned the whole imperial position in italy was rotten to the core lewis never freed himself from papal excommunication though he made repeated efforts and hoped much from the more compliant successors of john the twenty second but they had france at their backs and france was well content to see pope and emperor at strife the struggle had however important results in germany it led to a declaration of independence which showed the marked decline in papal authority at renza in thirteen thirty eight the electors proclaimed that since the empire depends on god alone he who was elected by the majority of votes can take the title of king and exercise all sovereign rights without need of the consent or confirmation of the pope the german character of the empire was little by little superseding the sacred and international position which had been the ideal of the middle ages the relations of lewis the bavarian with edward the third were indirectly part of the papal disputes for the emperor was glad to support the rival of the pope's ally philip the sixth the english king in thirteen thirty eight made a visit to germany and was entertained with great splendour and magnificence by lewis the two kings were already bound to each other by marriage ties for the emperor had taken as his second wife margaret of holland and Hainault, a sister of our own queen philippa the chief result of all this parade was the rather empty honour bestowed on edward of the office of imperial vicar or representative on the left bank of the rhine and this was almost all that england obtained from her high-sounding alliance with the emperor lewis had more on his hands than he could well manage without assisting english claims in france during almost the whole of his reign he was at enmity with his original ally john of bohemia he had troubles in lower bavaria austrian relations were not cordial his unstable and yet ambitious character was not likely to secure him firm friends and allies his last efforts at family acquisitions brought him into new troubles henry of carinthia and tyrol had a daughter and heiress with the very unattractive name of margaret maltash or pokemouth whatever her looks may have been her possessions were of such undoubted value that she had no lack of suitors and after an unhappy marriage with the second son of john of bohemia which was ended by divorce she was secured by lewis for his son the margrave of brandenburg a dispensation was required for the new marriage and this lewis proclaimed on his own imperial authority an action which stirred up anew the papal ire whilst there was considerable outcry in germany itself where the emperor was daily becoming more and more unpopular so strong was this feeling that pope clement the sixth had little difficulty in inducing 
five of the electors to choose a new king of the romans thirteen forty six in the person of charles of bohemia son of king john who lost his life in the same year at the battle of crecy lewis was engaged in raising men and money to meet this new danger when he was struck down by sudden death in the midst of a bear hunt near munich thirteen forty seven and left the field clear for the luxembourg candidate lewis the bavarian had passed a long and troubled reign he had been untiringly active and his courage and good humour had won him many friends in early life but he had little real force of character or stability and his policy was almost wholly concerned with family aggrandizement so that one after another his supporters lost patience and their belief in him turned to contempt and suspicion he had failed to establish his power in italy or to secure his rule in germany but he left the wittelsbach family in a very strong territorial position brandenburg bavaria the palatinate tyrol Eno and holland were all in the hands of members of that house the character and career of charles the fourth of luxembourg who ruled from thirteen forty seven to thirteen seventy five has given rise to considerable disagreement german historians as a rule have spoken of him slightingly amongst english writers bryce says severely that he legalized anarchy and called it a constitution and carlyle is palpably unjust in calling him an unesteemed creature who strove to make his time peaceable in the world by giving from the holy roman empire with both hands to every bull beggar or ready payer who applied on the other hand bohemian writers can scarcely praise him enough and they thank him for all that is best in their country's history for writes one he broke down the oppressive power of the overmighty feudal lord restored quiet and security within and without supported justice and good government increased the income of the state and encouraged industry so that in both mountain and valley skill and knowledge spread amongst the people religion and morality prevailed throughout the land perhaps maximilian i was partly right in calling him the father of bohemia but the stepfather of the empire his best work was done without doubt in his own country but his imperial rule was not so despicable after all and it was not altogether his fault that the power of the german king became less and less able to compete with the authority and privileges of the electoral princes charles's personal appearance was not attractive he was small his back was slightly bent and his head hung forwards his face was pale with very prominent cheekbones and his hair and beard were thick and black he always dressed very simply and his tunic was kilted to the knee never worn long and flowing he was neither a great warrior nor an impressive figure but he was a clear-headed prudent man a hard worker and a far-sighted statesman he preferred diplomacy to force and the substance of power to the show and pomp of majesty his policy was chiefly concerned with introducing order and stability into the government of the empire in advancing the welfare of the country especially of bohemia and in aggrandizing the house of luxembourg which he hoped to leave in permanent possession of the imperial dignity based on a strong territorial position of its own charles had many difficulties with which to contend his election had not been unanimous and was not undisputed there were other applicants for the office edward the third was at one time considered albert of austria put forward claims gunther of schwarzburg supported by the bavarian family was actually elected the emperor however knew how to win over his enemies or to take advantage of any chances in his favour he hampered the house of wittelsbach by encouraging a sham claimant to their possessions in brandenburg and the elector palatine head of the family was won over by the marriage of his daughter to charles himself whilst his own daughter was wedded to a son of the austrian duke to conciliate his rivals in that direction the black death also had diverted the country generally from political disputes the imperial cities sighing for order and quiet were easily conciliated by grants of privileges and finally the convenient death of gunther in thirteen forty nine 
left charles undisputed master of the situation his next step was a journey to rome for the imperial crown 1354 there was no resemblance between charles's attitudes toward italy and that of his father henry the seventh he went for the coronation alone and merely stayed in rome the one day necessary for this ceremony thus deliberately renouncing any claims to imperial rule in the peninsula and arousing considerable contempt in the italian towns of the north which would readily have welcomed a new head of the ghibelline party his return gave him the opportunity for that part of his work which is best known the formation of a rule for future imperial elections which was drawn up and published in the famous document known as the golden bull 1356 charles it must be remembered was not attempting any great change the practice of election and all its consequent evils were thoroughly established by this time but there were consistent disputes about the actual claim to electoral votes did they belong to the great fiefs themselves or to the great families which held those fiefs or to the imperial offices which members of those families generally filled what was to happen in case of the subdivision of fiefs the splitting up of families the abeyance of offices all these disputed points were made clear by the golden bull elections were in future to be held at frankfurt and a majority of votes alone was to be necessary electoral powers were to be exercised by the three archbishops of cologne mayence and treves and by four lay princes the king of bohemia imperial cupbearer the count palatine grand seneschal the duke of saxony grand marshal and the margrave of brandenburg grand chamberlain not one word was said in this important document either of papal sanction or papal confirmation and thus tacit recognition was made of the german character of the empire and its independence from the control of the head of the church in a sense the golden bull did legalize anarchy as bryce puts it it legalized electoral control and interference but at least it put an end to some of the worst difficulties which had beset previous elections charles had plenty of scope for his diplomatic talents he acquired what territory he could for his family but when friendship was more important than extension of boundaries he knew how to give way with a good grace this was shown more especially in the case of tyrol which fell vacant with the death of the only son of margaret Moltasch, and which he confirmed in the hands of the austrian habsburgs for his own family he gained by purchase and diplomacy the margravate of brandenburg which brought with it a second electoral vote the principal aim of his ambitions silesia moravia and bohemia were already his luxembourg and limburg were in the hands of a brother with the promise of reversion to bohemia marriage alliances gave hopes of future succession in holland hungary and poland germany was almost surrounded by hereditary estates of the luxembourg family charles won a final and very important triumph in the election and coronation during his lifetime of his son wenzel so that he could die with the assurance of having done what habsburg and wittelsbach had so far failed to effect in laying the apparent foundation of a hereditary claim to the imperial throne his last advice to his son and successor was very characteristic love god and thy friends be peaceful if thou canst gain anything with gentleness avoid war about it show consideration and honour for others have the pope priests and germans as friends thus wilt thou live and die in peace charles had done much even though he had not been uniformly successful he had failed to command respect in italy he had allowed the foundation of a very strong estate between himself and france for burgundy in the hands of the successors of philip the bold was to be a danger to future emperors as well as to future kings he had been forced to acknowledge the Schwabian League of Towns, although so independent a union was really contrary to the Golden Bull. He had helped to bring about the return of the Avignon popes to Rome, and lived just long enough to see how this resulted in the great schism of the papacy. Above all, he weakened the territorial position which he had built up with so much care by following the general custom of division amongst his sons nevertheless 
he left behind him a luxembourg emperor and a formidable array of luxembourg estates in bohemia he had founded the university of prague reformed the coinage improved means of communication encouraged trade and made himself beloved his name is still remembered in that of many a town many a bridge many a public building karlstadt karlsbad karlstein and many other places remind the traveller of one of the most important of the bohemian kings End of section two Section three of the End of the Middle Age, twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by Eleanor Constance Lodge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter two Italy, twelve seventy three to thirteen thirteen. Part one The history of Italy during this period is one of great difficulty since it is impossible to study it as a whole the country was split up into separate states independent republics and subject towns any sense of national unity was totally lacking patriotism though strong was wholly local or even municipal several causes had tended to bring about this condition of complete disunion italian geography was the original and dominant reason the long narrow shape of the peninsula rendered communication difficult between the extremities the country was divided from north to south by the chain of the apennines whilst the lateral spurs of these mountains split up the two long divisions into more or less detached portions and the plain of lombardy in the north was very much isolated from the rest this natural disunion had been strengthened by the nominal subjection of italy to the emperors whose dominion however shadowy had been sufficient to prevent the rise of any strong national power whilst the influence of the popes who were temporal lords in their own estates as well as the heads of christendom produced much the same effect add to this the fact that for years there had been a continuous struggle going on between pope and emperor in which all italians became more or less involved either as guelphs supporting the papacy or as ghibelline on the imperial side and it will be seen that party feuds were one more drop in the cup of discord and division these party enmities and party names continued long after they had lost most of their original significance not only were guelph states at war with ghibelline provinces but each state was itself split up into rival factions whose chief bond of union was common hostility to one another advance in italy did not take the line of growth toward nationality as was the case in countries such as england and france but in the north where progress was most rapid the town tended more and more to become the unit of political life cities became strong centres of influence whether they were republics or under the control of some dominant family and the large cities gradually obtained sway over the smaller towns and surrounded themselves with subject communes by the fifteenth century the chief of these municipalities had developed into regular city-states but at the close of the thirteenth century this process was only in the making in twelve seventy three savoy which was in our own day to become the centre of italian unity was scarcely part of italy at all lying to the west of the alps and originally belonging to the kingdom of arles it had split off as an almost independent province a fief of the empire alone its rulers had indeed subsequently enriched themselves by the acquisition of piedmont but for the present it stood entirely aloof from the complications and difficulties of the peninsula of the lombard cities milan had for a long time been by far the most prominent it had been a republic from at least the early twelfth century and had begun almost as soon to assert its supremacy over many of the surrounding and smaller towns now at the close of the thirteenth century the republican independence of milan was being rapidly lost martino della torre 
a guelph leader had headed the burgesses against the nobles and made himself lord of the city in 1209 only in his turn to succumb to the superior power of odo visconti in 1277 but the period of complete visconti supremacy as dukes of milan had not yet come and the city was weakened by a protracted struggle between these two families for some time longer the other chief powers in the north were genoa and venice the first was important as a commercial centre and was to become involved in trade disputes with other towns especially pisa and venice but otherwise she was fairly isolated from the history of the peninsula occupied with her own concerns and with quarrels between her own rival families venice the other great trading state directed her attention almost entirely toward the east here lay her chief power and her commercial and maritime supremacy which was undisputed until the rise of genoa introduced a formidable rival and a constant source of war and quarrel venetian history differs from that of most italian towns partly owing to her peculiar constitution a doge of venice had existed ever since the seventh century he was a duke elected for life at first by the whole body of the people and in early days invested with almost supreme despotic power though this was gradually usurped by his ambitious colleagues by twelve seventy three the election was in the hands of forty-one councillors chosen by a complicated system of drawing lots from amongst the whole body of the great council this great council had superseded the assembly of the whole people when the growth of population had rendered such a meeting totally impossible though at first elective and quite representative it had gradually changed into an exclusive hereditary aristocracy from thirteen nineteen all form of election ceased and it was understood that every son of a member entered the council at the age of twenty-five the doge was assisted by a senate or pregadi annually renewed from the great council but he was now really under the complete control of six ducal councillors a sort of ministerial cabinet without whom he could do nothing from thirteen ten a further committee was chosen by the great council which though at first only intended for a time of emergency became a permanent body known as the council of ten this council formed a sort of court of justice to deal with exceptional cases and was a strong weapon in the hands of the ruling aristocracy later it added to its judicial functions and interfered in most affairs of state although the constitution of venice was thus very oligarchical and aristocratic in the hands that is of a small number of the upper classes it was not in any sense feudal it was one of the peculiarities of the city that no distinction existed between merchants and nobles all the chief patricians were great traders and guildsmen not military and territorial lords the power of venice had gradually increased by the spread of commercial settlements and the subjection of surrounding lands until the name came to include much more than the islands on the rialto which formed the city itself it was not however till the fifteenth century that venetian territory reached its full development and that venice became a great mainland power participating in italian complications and even in european politics tuscany divided by the apennines from the lombard plain was split into a number of city-states pisa siena lucca all have interesting histories and rose to prominence at different times but the fame of florence has dwarfed the fame of other tuscan towns and gave her for a time supremacy over the whole district the internal history of florence had for a long time been marked by a heated struggle between nobles and people for power in the government the people had however one great source of strength and obtained some training in the art of governing through their craft guilds societies of those engaged in different crafts or industries which were well organized and very prosperous in twelve eighty two a great victory was won for the popular side 
by the recognition of the priors or leaders of the crafts as the chief magistrates of florence and by the rule that the nobles must enter a guild in order to qualify for office in twelve ninety three a further step was taken by insisting that all officials should actually practise at the trade of their guild while the nobles were subjected to especial severe rules in matters of justice the triumph of the people over the nobles was now complete but it tended to be an oligarchical triumph all the same for power was largely monopolized by the wealthy burgesses some amount of democratic or popular control was however maintained by means of the parlamento a mass meeting of all citizens which had authority to alter the laws by an appointed committee or balia the great defect of this constitution was its instability since the governing body was changed every two months as some remedy for this in thirteen twenty one a consultative council was added of twelve buonomini good men who were to hold office for six months instead of two and in thirteen twenty three a plan of choosing officials by lot was introduced to satisfy the passion for equality which prevailed amongst the florentines the government now consisted of number one the signori of nine members known as priors of the arts guilds with the gonfalonier of justice at their head six chosen from the major arts the more important guilds of bankers lawyers merchants and so forth and two from the minor arts of less important trades these were changed every two months number two sixteen gonfaloniers of the companies these were captains of the old military divisions of florence and were responsible for police and war number three twelve buonomini chosen every six months to give advice to the signory these two latter bodies were called the colleges number four the council of the people consisting of three hundred members all belonging to the guilds headed by the captain of the people number five the commune or council of the podesta a body of two hundred and fifty members some of whom could be nobles every two years a scrutiny was held an election of all considered worthy of office the names of those who gained a sufficient number of votes were put into bags and then drawn out by lot when officials were needed the chief glory of florence was her preeminence in art and literature if italy was the teacher of europe florence was the teacher of italy endless internal struggles family feuds and fierce warfare seem to have had little or no power to check the work of writer painter and builder indeed the prevailing turbulence appears to have acted as a fresh incentive to energy or perhaps it was the outward sign of the fiery zeal which was spreading through the people and leading to such brilliant results in the development of a literary and artistic renaissance to the southeast of tuscany lay the states of the church consolidated as a principality for the holy see by innocent the third and now comprising besides rome and the campagna the march of ancona and loose claims over romagna the emperor rudolph gave security to the popes for their temporal possessions by renouncing all claims to imperial sovereignty over them but such a territorial position though probably a necessity at the time brought many difficulties in its train it was this above all else which tended to weaken the spiritual prestige of the popes by involving them in the secular interests of a temporal dominion in the south of the peninsula the kingdom of naples and sicily united under norman sway in the twelfth century was the most extensive stretch of land under one ruler which yet existed in italy the hohenstaufen emperors had gained the crown by marriage and this had been one of the many causes of quarrel between themselves and the pope of that day who called to his assistance charles of anjou brother of saint louis of france charles by a victory over king manfred of sicily and by the defeat and death of conradin last of the hohenstaufen had obtained possession of the kingdom in twelve sixty eight and by twelve seventy three was the most powerful prince in italy bidding fair to gain ascendancy over the whole peninsula thanks to his own good fortune and the support of the papacy 
he was not only king of the two sicilies as naples and sicily together are often called but also imperial vicar and senator of rome whilst several towns of the north acknowledged him as lord in the period covered by this chapter a few main lines of policy and progress give some sort of connection to the whole the ambitions and eventual failure of charles of anjou the continuation of papal pretensions whilst the actual power of the popes is gradually being lost the attitude of the emperors toward their old dominions and the feeling of italy itself in regard to the imperial claims affect to some extent all parts of the country while in the north the rivalry between the city-states and the gradual advance of milan florence and venice are going on continuously in twelve seventy three an excellent pope sat on the throne of st peter gregory x was above all else an advocate of peace his highest wish was harmony throughout christendom which might lead to a united effort of europe for the recovery of the holy land to prepare the way for a successful crusade was the leading motive of his life something gregory was able to accomplish as the peacemaker of europe he negotiated between the warring cities of venice genoa and bologna he pacified for a time the struggle between guelphs and ghibellines declaring the doctrine strange in those days of intolerance they are ghibelline it is true but they are citizens men christians at the council of lyon in 1274 he succeeded if only for a time in uniting the greek and latin churches and inducing the greek emperor of constantinople to acknowledge papal supremacy at this same council he recognized the new emperor rudolph of Habsburg, who renounced his italian pretensions and promised to head the forthcoming crusade at the same time rules were drawn up for future papal elections which were to be solely in the hands of the cardinals in private conclave thus it was hoped to secure a speedy choice and to avoid the scandals which so often accompanied the proceedings peace and concord seemed secure at last when gregory's sudden death in twelve seventy six broke up the european confederation which he had just effected with so much labour and left christendom to fall back into a state of feud worse even than before the crusade was abandoned and the popes who followed were little more than italian princes themselves concerned far more with temporal concerns and family quarrels than with the welfare of the church at large three popes followed one another in rapid succession the third of these john the twenty first twelve seventy six a scholar and a mathematician had no love for monks or friars and was regarded with great suspicion by an age which looked on learning as a dangerous gift when he was killed by the falling of a roof in his own palace it was held to be a direct judgment and visions were recounted in which the evil one himself had been seen hewing down the supports next came a series of popes representing the leading families which were struggling for power in rome itself nicholas the third twelve seventy seven to twelve eighty belonged to the great house of orsini his successor martin the fourth twelve eighty to twelve eighty five was elected by the influence of charles of anjou and merely ruled as his creature honorius the fourth twelve eighty five to twelve eighty seven was a member of the roman family of savelli and was exalted at the expense of the orsini this pope who was such a martyr to gout that he could not rise or sit or open and shut his hands unaided invented some mechanical contrivance which turned him and moved him and enabled him to celebrate mass before the people the next pope nicholas the fourth twelve eighty eight to twelve ninety two represented the third great family in rome the colonna who now had their turn of public honours and dignities and party feuds rose higher than ever in the city so disastrous were these disputes that on the death of nicholas two years passed before a successor was fixed upon and then a wholly new departure was made in the choice of a holy hermit of obscure birth 
who had spent his life in solitude and self-torment after the fashion of the saints of those days a strange preparation for the public position to which he was now exalted already worn out both in body and mind by the life which he had led the hermit protested in vain that he was unfit for the office but the cardinals felt that they had been divinely guided in their choice and he was inaugurated as celestine v twelve ninety four and grand papal robes placed above his own coarse dress of sackcloth it did not require more than a few weeks to show the cardinals what a mistake they had made the new pope was totally ignorant and lacking in sense of dignity he fell into the unscrupulous hands of charles of anjou whom he believed to be a friend and was easily duped by all who surrounded him he gave away any dignity created any office for which he was asked indeed he could easily be persuaded to bestow the same post over and over again one of the cardinals the ambitious benedetto gaetani had peculiar influence over celestine and is supposed to have been largely responsible for inducing him to lay down his unwelcome dignity rumour indeed says that he resorted to the unworthy trick of terrifying him in the night through a hole in the wall and thus making him believe that a messenger from god was urging him to leave the world certain it is that the pope after five months could bear no more announced his abdication to the conclave and fled back with haste to his old cave in the mountains whilst the cunning benedetto was chosen in his place under the name of boniface the eighth end of section three section four of the end of the middle age twelve seventy three to fourteen fifty three by eleanor constance lodge this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter four italy twelve seventy three to thirteen thirteen part two with boniface the eighth twelve ninety four to thirteen o three the papacy made one last effort at universal supremacy the new pope owed his election largely to the influence of charles of naples he is said to have gone to the monarch with these words king thy pope celestine had the will and the means to serve thee in thy sicilian war but he had not the knowledge now if thou wilt work with thy cardinals that i may be elected pope i shall know and i shall will and i shall be able here then before proceeding further it will be well to see what these affairs were in sicily which required the papal interference charles king of naples and sicily was as we have already seen the most powerful of all temporal princes in the italian peninsula but the close of his life was involved in misfortunes and humiliations by no means undeserved french rule was hated with a fierce and bitter hatred in this southern kingdom and especially in sicily where charles moreover had a determined opponent in john of procida sometime physician to king manfred of the schwabian line whether stirred by personal or purely patriotic motives john was privately working for the downfall of the angevin dynasty and intriguing for this purpose with pedro king of aragon who himself had a claim to the throne from his marriage with manfred's daughter constance of sicily the train was laid therefore although the fire was kindled by a chance spark which suddenly precipitated the explosion on easter tuesday the thirty first of march twelve eighty two the people of palermo having just celebrated the evening service were preparing to spend the rest of the day in amusements of all sorts when a body of french soldiery arrived nominally to keep the peace this in itself excited some discontent but it was a wanton insult offered by a frenchman to a young sicilian girl who was passing on the arm of her betrothed which roused the popular fury the cry of death to the french was raised everywhere all the long smouldering anger of the people burst forth with unrestrained violence the french were massacred on all sides none neither priests nor women nor little children were spared 
two thousand french were said to have perished in the sicilian vespers and these were flung for burial into an empty pit from palermo the excitement spread to the whole island all sicily was in arms and in a month no frenchmen were left in their lost territory the struggle begun by the people was continued by the king of aragon charles vowed recovery and vengeance if he could live a thousand years he would go on raising the cities burning the lands torturing the rebellious slaves he would leave sicily a blasted barren uninhabited rock as a warning to the present age an example to the future fortunately he was never able to fulfil his threat pedro claimed the kingdom and his fleet under the celebrated admiral roger of loria defeated the french ships and captured charles prince of salerno son of the king of naples himself in the battle of messina 1284 in 1285 a number of deaths changed the chief actors in the struggle without ending the war in one year 1285 charles himself died at foggia philip of france who had taken up arms on behalf of his brother charles of valois to whom the pope had offered the crown of aragon fell ill in spain and ended his days at perpignan pedro wounded in the same war perished a few weeks later martin the fourth the pope who had been so completely the creature of charles of anjou likewise quitted the scene pedro's son alfonso succeeded him without any difficulty in the spanish kingdom whilst his younger brother james was proclaimed king of sicily an attempt was made to end the dispute by the arbitration of edward i of england and in twelve eighty eight a treaty arranged that charles the second of anjou should be released and assume the crown of naples but that sicily should be confirmed to james of aragon negotiations however were vain charles when released claimed both the sicilies and war continued as before and was still continuing when boniface the eighth became pope even the accession of james to the throne of aragon and his consent to relinquish the sicilian kingdom did not decide the matter for the sicilian people resolutely refused to submit to the house of anjou they placed themselves under another brother of pedro of aragon known as frederick who in thirteen o two ended the long quarrel by a marriage with the sister of charles of naples despite promises of reversion the restoration that is of sicily on his death the two kingdoms remained separate under different rulers until fourteen forty two when both came into the hands of the king of aragon alfonso v from this it will be seen that boniface despite his promises was not of great assistance to charles of naples and it was in connection with this struggle that he summoned to italy another foreign prince whose interference was not limited to sicily and who roused universal indignation throughout the country in which the pope was included this was charles of valois the second son of philip the third of france who had already figured as the papal nominee for the throne of aragon he remained after concluding the ignominious treaty with sicily to turn his arms against florence and to trample on her liberties boniface made many enemies he did all he could in rome to degrade the proud family of colonna dangerous foes as he was about to find to his cost he took little trouble to restrain his violent temper and quick tongue whilst performing the ash wednesday ceremony of scattering ashes on the heads of penitents to remind them of their end he flung them into the eyes of a personal rival exclaiming ghibelline remember that you are but dust and with the other ghibelines your fellows you will return to dust it was not only in italy that the pope brought himself into trouble he claimed a european supremacy which led him to interfere in all that was going forward when albert of austria became emperor in the place of adolf of nassau boniface refused to recognize him and put the crown on his own head as a sign of his control over the imperial election it is i who am caesar 
I who am emperor, I who will defend the rights of the empire, he is reported to have cried. Both England and France were to be brought under his control. The clergy of all countries were only to be taxed by him, said Boniface, and by his bill, Clericis Laicos, publicly asserted the same in France and England, where Philip the Fourth and Edward the First, respectively, were trying to make the spiritual estate share in national burdens. But in England and France the Pope met his match. The English clergy, after a long dispute, submitted to the king, and when Boniface summoned Edward to answer for his conduct in Scotland before the papal court, laymen and churchmen alike supported him in his refusal. With Philip the Fourth, the quarrel was still more heated and still more important. The discontented Colonna joined hands with the French king, and a combined attack at Anagni upon the pope who was imprisoned in his own palace gave a shock to the old man from which he never recovered. His subsequent restoration to Rome was followed almost immediately by his death. Villani, the Italian historian, says of Boniface, he was very wise both in learning and in natural wit, and a man very cautious and experienced and of great knowledge and memory, very haughty he was and proud and cruel towards his enemies and adversaries, and was of great heart and much feared by all people. Whatever might be the Pope's character, universal horror was excited by the treatment which he received, and it was prophesied that great troubles would come upon Philip and his lineage in consequence. Villani says again, the judgment of God is not to be marvelled at, for albeit Pope Boniface was more worldly than was fitting to his dignity, and had done many things displeasing to God, God caused him to be punished, after the fashion that we have said, and afterwards he punished the offender against him, not so much for the injury against the person of Pope Boniface, as for the sin committed against the divine majesty whose countenance he represented on earth. For the time being, however, Philip seems to have had everything his own way. Benedict XI, 1303 to 1305, the next pope, was reconciled with him, and Clement V, 1305 to 1314, the Archbishop of Bordeaux who succeeded, was completely won over. With Boniface VIII, says Bishop Creighton, fell the medieval papacy. Under an outward appearance of strength, decline had been steadily progressing. As Italian lords, the popes were losing some of their old prestige, and their power in Rome was constantly undermined by family jealousies. Either the pope was supported by the Orsini, the Colonna, or the Savelli, or he was weakened by their hostility. That the papacy was not strong enough to manage even the affairs of Italy had been shown by the unwise policy of introducing foreign aid. The summons of Charles of Anjou was the first mistake, and he soon became a rival rather than a tool. The character of many of the popes was not calculated to exalt the respect felt for the Holy See, and when Celestine V virtually denied his own infallibility, it was impossible that others should preserve their belief totally unshaken. Finally, the worldliness and violence of Boniface degraded the holy office still further, and his vexatious interference in other countries raised European hostility and national resistance. With Clement V began that residence of the popes at Avignon, known as the Babylonish Captivity, 1305 to 1370 which diminished irrevocably their influence over church and state alike. Rightly or wrongly, they were considered for the time as mere vassals of France and treated accordingly. Later struggles and later difficulties were to hasten still further their downward career. Meanwhile, to turn to town history, the chief interest of the period centers round Florence, where the poet Dante was now living and working, and taking that part in political events which was to end in his banishment from home, and the casting in of his lot with that of the Ghibelline party. Tuscany, 
throughout the latter half of the thirteenth century was still engaged in active rivalry between the two great parties of guelph and ghibelline success leaning to the side of the former owing partly to the strong position won for them by charles of anjou who acted as imperial vicar florence for the most part was a stronghold of the guelphs and here at least the leading characteristic of this party came to be the support of popular government whilst the ghibelline represented the aristocracy struggle within and without was incessant without the city was occupied by war with pisa and arezzo over the latter she won the victory of campelduno where dante fought within the popular party was busy building up the democratic constitution which has already been described by the close of the century florence had worked her way to a very important position all tuscany was for the time at her feet some towns as friends others as subjects at home she was tranquil rich and ruled by a popular government literature and art were making rapid progress this state of tranquillity was but short-lived family feuds broke out with renewed fury in the fourteenth century especially between the two great houses of the cerchi and the donati the former were a family of merchants very rich but not noble the latter were poor and aristocratic headed by corso donati who is described as gentle of blood beautiful in person polished in manners of pleasing conversation a subtle intellect and a mind ever intent on evil to these internal troubles worse were added by the connection of florence with pistoia the latter was a small town about twenty miles distant which was in so terrible a state of turbulence and disorder owing to the quarrels between two branches of the same family which had taken the names of the blacks and the whites that appeal was made to florence who accepted the government of the city for three years this meant the introduction of the struggle between blacks and whites within their own walls the blacks became identified with the donati the whites with the cerchi in vain the florentine priors amongst whom at this time was the poet dante banished the leaders of both factions impartially this only led to a conspiracy without and the blacks intrigued with charles of valois who willingly accepted the chance of power in florence and coming nominally as a peacemaker sent by the pope made himself master of the town and readmitted corso donati thirteen o one now followed a period of misery and violence far worse than before charles of valois took advantage of this opportunity for extortion and oppression the whites were banished from florence in great numbers dante was proscribed probably for having resisted a grant of public money to the rapacious frenchman he left never to return charles stayed long enough to make a fortune and win universal hatred he then slunk back to france leaving florence in a turmoil of domestic war and external intrigue which it would take too long to attempt to disentangle a short calm followed the death of corso donati who suffered the penalty of too much success was proscribed by the government and murdered by his enemies and in the same year the city succeeded in winning a repeal of the interdict under which they had been lying for years by sending help to a papal army and so once more becoming friends of the holy see but nothing was sufficient to quiet domestic discord a chronicler of the time laments the evils of such a state and predicts the results that must follow thus our city continues tormented thus obstinate in evil deeds remain our citizens and what is done to-day is blamed to-morrow o oh, wicked citizens ye that have corrupted and vitiated mankind by your evil customs and unhallowed gains ye are those who have introduced every evil habit into the world and now the world will reward you the emperor with all his power will come upon you and plunder you by sea and land many still felt that the only hope for italy was a strong ruler and the theory of the medieval empire was not yet dead dante represents this view in his de monarchia 
and all through the divina commedia also illustrations can be found of his passion for the ideal of rome as the centre of a universal monarchy never for a moment would dante deny the spiritual supremacy of the pope but neither would he admit papal claims to superiority over a roman emperor for one divine right over eternal life for the other equally divine right over temporal concerns for peace one must rule mankind is most like god when at unity for god is one therefore under a monarchy and again let caesar show toward peter the reverence wherewith a first-born son honours his father that being illumined by the light of his paternal favour he may the more excellently shine forth upon the whole world to the rule of which he has been appointed by him alone who is of all things both spiritual and temporal the king and governor with henry the seventh of luxembourg this imperial ideal seemed to have one more hope of success rudolph of Habsburg and his immediate successors had strengthened their position as german monarchs they had been fully occupied without asserting wider claims italy they had abandoned henry the seventh thirteen ten declared his determination to assert imperial rights in italy put down factions and receive the crown of rome he came at a time of great need and at first his success was surprising the lombard cities opened their gates to him with strict impartiality he restored their exiles whether guelph or ghibelline deputies from nearly every state hastened to swear allegiance at milan he received the iron crown of lombardy laurel leaves in their steel polished and shining as a sword and with many large pearls and other stones and the people wept tears of joy at genoa he was received with honour and appointed imperial vicar over the republic the real insecurity of his position was however soon obvious the impressionable people welcomed his coming and rebelled against him as soon as his back was turned the emperor was poor and obliged to levy taxes and this more than all else raised opposition florence was his most determined enemy and florentine intrigues were largely responsible for the insurrections against him and a guelphic league was formed in tuscany with robert king of naples at its head the ghibelline city of pisa received him indeed with great favour and supplied him with men and money for his advance to rome here his coronation fell very flat for prince john of naples held st peter's and the ceremony performed at st john lateran thirteen twelve was robbed of much of its effect the next year was one of war for the newly crowned emperor he made vain attempts against florence devastated the country round and made a league with sicily and genoa against the hostile king of naples whether henry could even for a time have made good his authority remains for ever doubtful for worn out by exertions and an illness which he had disregarded in order not to discourage his soldiers he died so suddenly before siena in thirteen thirteen that all believed him to have been poisoned he had taken the sacrament immediately before and the rumour spread that the priest had caused his death by administering poisoned wine such a tale was all too readily believed in those days whatever the truth may be with henry perished the dream of upholding the universal authority of the emperor his was the last real attempt to assert such claims and italy was left without a sovereign henry the seventh was an able prince full of enthusiasm and energy inspired by the highest principles villani says of him that he was never depressed in adversity nor unduly elated by success and that it was astonishing how much he achieved in so short a time and with such scant resources the difficulties of his task must however have proved insurmountable in the long run the dissensions and divisions of italy were too deeply rooted to be healed by even the strongest authority and henry as a foreigner could hardly have expected universal support the days of imperial rule were really over dante was preaching a theory which had long lost any practical significance henry died in a noble but vain attempt to revive 
an obsolete ideal. End of section 4